In the early rounds of fantasy football drafts, it is extremely important to hit on your picks. And we are going to go through our must draft players in every round in the first four rounds of fantasy drafts. Each of us is going to bring one to the table and then kind of an honorable mention that we both like at this point. I'm sure everybody's got their guys. We're going to basically give you ours in the early rounds, the guys that we have ended up with the most in the drafts that we've done so far. So, Danny, let's not waste any time. Let's get right into round one. You guys can see the round one values on the screen right now. And we also have our FSE rank. So that's me and Danny's combined rankings um, compared to the average of home league platforms like Sleeper, ESPN. We also mix in underdog to get a little bit of sharpness in there as well. Yahoo and NFL fantasy. So you guys can kind of see on average where we rank versus the average of the multi-site ADP. The guy that I'm bringing to the table here is Brees Hall, running back of the New York Jets, finishes the RB6 in PPR points per game last year and was averaging 20 points per game after the week five area when Robert Sala said that his training wheels were off and he was going to get a full workload. Let me remind you what Brees Hall actually did this in the circumstances he did it in. Did all this with Zach Wilson and Tim Boyle and Trevor Simeon as his quarterback. Aaron Rodgers is back. Even if he's 80% of his former self, Brees is absolutely going nuts. And he's a top three running back town in the NFL. Vastly improved offensive line, which is definitely an underrated thing for Brees specifically. PFF has them ranked top six entering the 2024 season as far as offensive lines are concerned. He led all running backs and targets last year. He scored nine touchdowns despite having just one goal line carry on the season and 29 red zone touches because the Jets were so god-awful that they never got to the red zone, and also when they were in the red zone, they just refused to give Brees Hall the ball. So there's some concerns like, oh, Aaron Rodgers usually passes in the red zone and things of that nature, but the amount of red zone trips added to the fact that this offense has Aaron Rodgers is the thing I'm concerned with. For me, I look at Brees Hall as the safest running back in the first round. I don't have the balls to draft him over Christian McCaffrey, but I do... And I will say that he is 100% on par with Christian McCaffrey and definitely a safer acquisition. And I'm glad you made the case of him potentially being valued over Christian McCaffrey because, again, I don't personally have the balls to do it knowing that Christian McCaffrey burned us last year attached to that good offense. Maybe even with Brandon Ayuk gone, we see even a higher ceiling than what we saw last year with Christian McCaffrey. But with Brees Saw, if you're talking about checking every single box at the running back position in his prime, potentially top 10 level offense with the Jets this year with Aaron Rodgers staying healthy, improved offensive line play with Olu Fashanu and Tyron Smith coming over this year, Elijah Vera Tucker potentially returning from injury. Like you're jotting down every single checkbox for Brees Hall and he checks it off in spades. Elite receiver, elite rush, uh, rush over expectation last year. We saw once he got his full workload in the most unideal circumstances on that Jets offense last year, week five on coming off that ACL injury was legitimately scoring over 19 points per game. So again, his floor last year in those circumstances being over 19 points per game and knowing what the ceiling could potentially unfold, giving his involvement in the past game, man. If you told me you wanted to take this guy third overall, even I wouldn't have any arguments against it. No, I, I would say if people have him ranked RB1 or if they want to take him over potentially Lamb or Tyreek because they know that they can get good wide receiver talent in the second and the third and the fourth round because of how their league is structured, I don't think it's outrageous to say you take this guy as high as even first overall potentially. So keeping yeah. on the same team, if you guys have a late first round pick, one guy that we absolutely also love is his teammate Garrett Wilson. Yeah, and I swear we're always just in on the Jets, but yeah, we're continuing the theme of the Jets here. I don't think many realize just how high of a ceiling Garrett Wilson actually has in fantasy this year. Obviously, they know, you know, the first couple years of his career, solid wide receiver, you know, very, very promising young talent, but people don't realize just how historic Garrett Wilson has actually been. We're getting a third-year breakout candidate who has quite literally been on an historic volume pace to start his career. Amongst all players in their first two career seasons in the NFL, Garrett Wilson actually has the third most targets all time, only trailing Marvin Harrison Sr. and Jimmy Smith, who played for the Jacksonville Jaguars. You do see some names there like, you know, Justin Jefferson, Odell Beckham Jr., Keenan McArdle, you know, Larry Fitzgerald. All those guys on that list were legitimate 1,300 plus yard wide receivers at some point in their NFL career. So that kind of goes to show you that with Garrett Wilson, we are in rarefied territory for him. We also see his reception perception profile by Matt Harmon is absolutely spot on 96th percentile against man 79th percentile against zone 93rd percentile against press the overall numbers have been fine to start his career but 
for the most part, we see from the peripherals, both in terms of the targets he's commanded, in terms of the separation he was creating, that he is an elite NFL wide receiver that has not had his elite NFL year yet. And with Aaron Rodgers coming off that injury, like you said, this was a guy that between 2018 and 2022 ranked top five in the NFL in terms of EPA at the quarterback position. So if you're just, like I said with Brees Hall, checking the boxes off the list, elite talent, Garrett Wilson's got that in spades. Alpha of his offense, absolutely, like I said, third most targets of all time in a player's first two seasons, not to mention the exceptional quarterback play that we could potentially expect with Aaron Rodgers coming back. Tell me the difference between the Garrett uh, Wilson profile this year versus the C.D. Lamb profile two years ago. Not the year that he had this year. Obviously, if Garrett Wilson went out there, had 1,800 yards, 15 touchdowns, not only would he be a value at the end of the first round, you could make the case he would be the 101 going into 2025. But even if he just had what we saw from C.D. Lamb a couple years ago, 1,300 plus yards, nine touchdowns, I believe that season, he would pay off in a big way at that late first valuation. Again, a lot of people want to see it before they make him their pick, but if you wait too long on Garrett Wilson, there's a very good chance he's a top three to five overall pick next year. Yeah, if we're playing the exercise of like who could really be like the 101 next year or a really high-end first-round pick, I actually think he has C.D. Lamb's 2023 season I agree. in his range of outcomes. I think he could have 17, 1,800 yards, 15 touchdowns this year because, like you said, he is the clear alpha of his offense. Nobody on that offense is sniffing 100 targets outside of maybe Brees Hall, to be honest. And on Aaron Rodgers-led offenses, the second target has traditionally been the lead running back, not even the number two wide receiver. He locks onto his alphas. We know this. They're going to throw the ball at a pretty high rate as well. They have been a pass-heavy offense under Nathaniel Hackett before. So for me, I, I look at Aaron Rodgers and this Jets offense and I just I, it's so concentrated we know exactly which two guys to draft which is why they're both going in the first round one honorable mention of the first round that we have here is Amon Ross St. Brown obviously elite zone beating wide receiver attached to a top five offense elite offensive line really good quarterback play and improved defense too which is an underrated thing for you know time of possession and things of that nature he was a 20 point per game scorer last year despite fighting through a bunch of injuries and if you guys have been watching the receiver documentary you see exactly what he was fighting through the shoulder injuries and things of that nature 30 percent target share top three in red zone targets he is absolutely nails in the mid first round if you guys are picking anywhere between like five to ten and sometimes he's even available later than that he's my wide receiver three in fantasy this year i would draft him over justin jefferson over jamar chase again i don't think everybody shares that sentiment but i just view st brown as one of the safest picks in the first round that you can make and in the first round some people are shooting for that safety especially in full ppr i feel like you're locked and loaded a 20 point per game receiver yeah like there's no issues with me with him hunter st brown and in fact i do think any of those three wide receivers you mentioned chase jefferson and Hunter st brown mm -hmm. If you had told me they were going eighth of that group, I would say that they were the biggest value of that range. So it kind of goes to show you, man, that you want a top eight overall pick this year. And if you don't have a top eight overall pick, our best bet would be Garrett Wilson at that ninth spot. Yep, absolutely. So let's transition into round two. And again, you guys can see on the screen that we have our FSC rank, consensus rankings versus home league ADP, and then kind of the difference between us versus the home league ADP. And of course, that is available in our draft guide. If you guys want to check that out, link down below in the pinned comment and in the description to get our draft guide, all of our rankings and this feature for free. But Drake London is the guy that I'm bringing to the table in round two. People really need to see it first with him. You mentioned that kind of with Garrett Wilson, but with Drake London, he hasn't even been nearly as productive as Garrett Wilson has been so far in this career he's proven to be an elite wide receiver at commanding targets he's been a 29.5 percent target share guy as a 21 year old rookie 32 percent targets per route run that year and last year in 2023 reached a bunch of good statistical thresholds and reception perception over an 80% success rate against zone over a 71% success rate against man beat press coverage over 80 uh, percentile right there. The big issue for London has been his situation because like Garrett Wilson, he has not had a quarterback whatsoever. 38th graded passer last year, Desmond Ritter of 41 qualified quarterbacks was his guy last year. And then his rookie season, he had 30th graded Marcus Mariota who threw for like 2,700 passing yards. So this offense has been starved for a quarterback with Kirk Cousins coming in. He has been a wide receiver kingmaker in years past. We've seen what he's done for Justin Jefferson, what he's done for Stefan Diggs, what he's done for Adam Thielen. We've seen what he's done for his top target basically over the last couple of years. And even if he gets hurt, you have a top 10 overall pick behind him in Michael Penix, who's better than any quarterback that London has played with, even going back to his days at USC, because that was a big problem for him then too. Then you get to the volume issue, and that's kind of been the difference between Wilson and London this point in, this, in their career. 
Yeah. The Falcons have ranked second worst in pass rate over expected in London's career since 2022. They've been a bottom five complete eyesore efficiency wise as a passing offense and new offensive coordinator Zach Robinson comes in from the Sean McVay Rams. That means more volume and of course more efficiency now with Kirk Cousins at the helm at quarterback. So for me, we used to get all these third year wide receiver breakouts. That used to be the thing, right? Remember Chris Godwin and Calvin yeah. Ridley and all these guys, Drake London's next up on the list. And thankfully in home leagues, you can get him towards the end of the second round as opposed to an underdog where all the sharps are drafting him basically at the one, two turn right now. So that should be an indication that he is a great projection. The sharps are drafting him at the one, two turn. He goes more so in that like 23, 24 overall range in home league drafts. Yeah. The case with Drake London is pretty hilarious when you're just looking at it holistically, because this is a guy that was drafted top 10 has commanded the volume that he has from a pure share basis. And I mean, everybody likes, likes to point out the fact that Arthur Smith doesn't know what the hell he's doing. I mean, we talked about it with B. John Robinson last year. I mean, it applied to the wide receivers as well. The fact that, like you said, they were the second lowest in terms of pass rate over expected over that time. Not to mention, you're getting inherently more passing volume and you're getting more better quality in terms of that passing volume. With Kirk Cousins coming in, man, like people want to talk about situation for wide receivers and how much it matters. But when it applies to a guy like Drake London, who hasn't even had his breakout year in the NFL left, now getting that big upgrade from Desmond Ritter to whether it's Kirk Cousins for the whole season or even Michael Penix Jr., both of those options would be the best quarterback play of Drake London's career. So I understand it doesn't feel the greatest seeing, you know, Drake London in the top 15 because of where he's finished in fantasy across his last couple of years and the fact that we haven't, like you said, seen it yet. But if you wait to see it from these young guys, you're going to miss the train. You're going to miss the boat because, quite frankly, you miss it from Drake London. He goes out there like Garrett Wilson has a 1,300 plus yard, eight plus touchdown year, and Kirk Cousins looks like Kirk Cousins from Minnesota. He's going to be a top eight overall pick next year. Yeah, exactly. You can't wait to see it with these guys. If the projection is there, which it is with London and the wide receiver league winners video, the only thing he doesn't really check the box on is that his secondary target in his offense, Kyle Pitts, will probably see more than 100 targets. Every other box, he pretty much checks pass volume, quarterback play, talent, ability, reception, perception stuff, low injury concern, all that kind of stuff that you want to see out of your early round wide receiver picks. And I think he's a great pick, especially knowing that you can actually get him in the late second round of most home leagues. So you are on the board here. Jameer Gibbs is the guy that you're saying is a great pick in the second round this just doesn't really make sense to me because in wide receiver piss boy rooms on underdog he goes as a first round pick in terms of adp he goes higher in terms of wide receiver rooms on underdog than he does in these high t home league rooms of your redraft leagues the other difference i do notice between home leagues and underdog adp is that jonathan taylor is listed with a higher adp in home leagues than jameer gibbs i just don't understand why that is the case with jameer gibbs once he saw his workload expand post his injury he was a near 20 plus ppr point per game back his average of 19.4 ppr points per game would have paced as the rb3 across the entirety of last year he was doing this on the back of elite rushing efficiency and actual touchdown equity in that stretch he was averaging 0 0.9 rushing touchdowns per game that wasn't even the best part of his prospect profile. When Jameer Gibbs was coming into the NFL draft as the RB2 behind Bijan Robinson, the best part of his profile was his profile as a receiver out of the backfield. And he had, by his standards, a very inefficient rookie year as a receiver. Despite that, he was still as dominant as he was once he came back from injury. So he's already showed elite play as a rusher, and we haven't even seen it be untapped in terms of what he could do as a receiver. Again, in terms of his receiving profile, just so you know how dominant he was, uh, in terms of some of the best receiving back profiles we've seen in the NFL, you know, Christian McCaffrey, Brees Hall, Travis Etienne, Alvin Kamara, you know, guys like that. As you guys can see, across his three years out of high school, Jameer Gibbs ranked first in his first year out of high school, second only behind Christian McCaffrey in his second year, and second only behind Christian McCaffrey in his third year. So when you're connecting the dots and you see that he already figured it out majorly on a top five to ten level offense with the Detroit Lions as a rusher, if we get that type of prospect profile Jameer Gibbs receiving line that we could expect going forward, man, this guy has the opportunity to break fantasy football, not to mention this is literally the year going into year two where historically Ryan Heath has discovered running backs have their best year in the NFL. We do see in year one, 85.9% of the expectation across their career average in terms of the points per game. We do see that rise to over 120%. So with Jameer Gibbs, the history is telling you that year two running back smash. We already saw him be able to produce as a rusher in year one. If we just get what his prospect profile would literally lean him into in his year two, we could be looking at a legitimate 23 plus PPR point per game ceiling. 
Yeah, especially if you guys do play in full PPR leagues, he is a much easier click than Jonathan Taylor because Jonathan Taylor isn't really used that much as a receiving back. So yeah, David Montgomery is probably going to work in on the ground, but David Montgomery takes away a lot of the dirty touches, a lot of the the types of carries we don't even really want Jameer Gibbs to get. He'll probably snipe him on the goal line every once in a while, but I don't think it's going to happen nearly as much as it happened at the beginning first seven to eight weeks of last year because Jameer Gibbs was a rookie. That's typically what NFL coaches don't trust rookies on the goal line, but we saw that kind of correct itself as the season went along, as you said. Yeah, it, well, it, the thing that just baffled me when I did that projection, when I did that true split is I expect, you know, maybe a little bit more than what he did in the receiving game, only 5.2 targets per game, 3.8 receptions, only 24.6 receiving yards per game. What he was able to do in terms of his touchdown equity of what could, we could expect to be a top five to 10 level offense. Again, everybody understands, you know, Ben Johnson, the offensive line with Detroit, obviously Jared Goff in a dome. We project that offense to score a ton of points and he was averaging 0.9 rushing touchdowns per game. Even if you were the biggest pro Jameer Gibbs guy going into the last year, you couldn't have expected that level of rushing touchdown efficiency like he was able to display once he got healthy. Yeah, because Montgomery, like we said, was was really heavily involved on the goal line, but that was mostly early in the season. Uh, it kind of evened out as the season went along. And again, year two running backs, you guys know the song and dance. So honorable mention for us in this range of the draft is Marvin Harrison Jr., who on sharp sites like underdog goes basically in the the, the one two turn yeah. especially with this puka nakua news he is going around the mid second round in home leagues and the reason i think he's absolutely worthy of this if you guys are just coming back to the scene you might be like why are we taking a rookie this high because rookie wide receivers don't usually go this high but he is the best rookie prospect we've ever seen realistically in the history of the fsc prospect model since 2016 he is basically four or five percent better than Jamar Chase and CeeDee Lamb as a prospect. So we're talking about a legit alpha projection. And he went to a very good situation to see uh, he lands in an ascending offense with Kyler Murray, who has been a top 10, top 15 NFL quarterback who can get him the football. He has been a quarterback traditionally who has fed his number one option as well, going back to when he had guys like Marquise Brown and CeeDee Lamb in college and DeAndre Hopkins earlier on in his career. He fed DeAndre Hopkins over 10 targets per game that they were on the field together. So with if we just expect that Harrison is simply just this good and he's going to walk into the NFL and be a top 15 NFL wide receiver, then he projects for 150 plus targets. He projects for 1300 receiving yards, eight touchdowns his rookie season. Like I know that sounds like a lofty projection for a rookie wide receiver, but really the Sharks are already him. betting on that. And we're already inherently ready to do that with this guy's prospect profile. And again, if we just said, oh, he's going to be as good of a receiver as like AJ Brown is, or as good of a receiver as Devontae Adams is. Imagine if Devontae Adams and Marvin Harrison switch places right now, how high would we be drafting Devontae Adams? It's the same exact situation. If we just assume Harrison's this good, which is 80, his draft capital, his prospect profile would indicate, then we should be drafting him as if he's already really good. There's legitimately no reason to fade Marvin Harrison Jr. other than rookie, question mark. Like, if you are looking at his overall profile, and we kind of mentioned it with Garrett, we mentioned it with Brees Hall, we mentioned it with other guys on this video, but if you were to just check down volume, uh, volume opportunity, absolutely exists there with Arizona outside of Trey McBride. A lot of real uncertainty around that receiver core. I wouldn't be surprised, like you said, if Marvin Harrison Jr. in his rookie season was a legitimate 25-plus uh, target share type of guy. Talk about the talent. Obviously, top five overall pick. One of the best uh, receiver prospects. Actually, the best wide receiver prospect we have seen brought up according to the FSC prospect model. Not to mention the quarterback plays there. The potential offensive improvement. Again, we saw when Kyler Murray was healthy in the last couple of years, this Arizona offense be a legitimate top 10 to 12 level offense in the NFL. So with Marvin Harrison Jr., like you said, the only question mark we have is he's a rookie, but we've had that question mark with Justin Jefferson. We've had that question mark with Puka Nakua. At the end of the day, if you have the talent level and you have the opportunity in your offense to be able to produce, these young wide receivers produce far earlier than we've seen. You know, this isn't 2006 anymore. This isn't 2004 anymore. This isn't, you know, the rookie wide receivers got to learn the ropes and he may be unproductive in his rookie year. If you are this level of talent with this level of opportunity, guess what? The production will fall you. And I do think Marvin Harrison Jr. has got the opportunity to be talked about with the CD Lambs, with the Jamar Chases, with the AJ Browns, like I mentioned with Garrett Wilson. Yeah, I mean, three of the last four years, the rookie receiving yardage record has gone down. Puka Nakua broke it last year. Jamar Chase broke it his sec or his rookie year, and Justin Jefferson broke it as a rookie in 2020. Three of the last four years, a rookie has broken that record. So I would not be shocked if one of Marvin Harrison or maybe Malik Neighbors takes it down this year. Wouldn't shock me one bit. Let's head into round three, where we have a couple Dolphins and a couple uh, another uh, big-time wide receiver breakout from last year. Devon H., what's up?
I was just going to say, you, you, you. I was proud when I saw who you picked for this video because if you guys have been following the channel for a little bit, I've been the pro HN guy. So I just want to say formally, welcome aboard, Corey. Welcome aboard. Yeah. I mean, as far as I'm <laughs> concerned, you're too low on HN because I haven't ranked higher than you do now. So wow. uh, Devon HN, the reason he checks every single box for a future league winner is because when you stack up what league winning running backs have in common, it's usually that they're very young. They're attached to great offenses. They have a lot of receiving upside. They have an elite talent profile. And Devon Achan literally checks every single box, minus the fact that he's a little bit smaller. He has big play speed. He's in a great offense. Basically, his rookie running back expected half PPR points per game, like broke fantasy models, like the best expected fantasy points per game over producer that we've really ever seen. This guy, rush yards over expected. He averaged like seven yards per carry last year. This guy is absolutely ridiculous. In games that he played over 10% of the snaps, which he broke down in the Truth Series, he was producing producing over 115 scrimmage yards per game, 1.26 touchdowns per game, 15.63 opportunities. So we're talking 15 opportunities a game he's producing at this level. The big kind of bugaboo that people have about Devon Achan and the one that I had with him originally is that Raheem Mostert is going to get work and Devon Achan is a smaller dude. He's not the type of guy that you want to feed 25 touches to. But number one, it appears that he's actually added a little bit of size. So that's definitely helpful. Number two, Raheem Mostert's 33 years old with the third highest injury percentage uh, projection according to sports injury predictor. And last year was the only time he's ever stayed healthy in his entire career. And number three, while I actually don't really give two shits that Devon Achan is too, is too small, it actually might work in his benefit. The offense that he plays in, the fact that they're probably never going to give him 22, 25 touches a game because it'll actually keep him on the field. Even if he only gets 15 to 20 touches a game, we're talking about a guy that in this offense can produce high-level weighted opportunity type of numbers. He's going to get six, seven targets a game. He's going to get opportunities in the red zone. We know he has 4-3 track speed that he can break off the long runs. I really don't care about his volume projection. This is a heuristic over projection type of guy. Second year running backs who are this talented as rookies smash Camara, David Johnson, all these type of dudes that post this level of high efficiency as rookies, they get monster workloads or monster projections in their second year. Anything else is just gravy. I'll take Devon a chain at the end of the second round, early third round. If he gets 17 touches a game, anything more than that. And I would be the happiest person in the world. And I actually hope that they don't give him a workhorse role. You could tell me he was at 15 touches per game, and I still think at the 2-3 turn it'd be valuable considering the fact that not many running backs in the NFL we can project to be, you know, top five, top eight level in terms of overall efficiency at the position. I think top five to eight may even be just the understatement with Devon A. Chan because like you said, he was the most efficient running back in the NFL last year, and we've seen it with David Johnson, with Alvin Kamara. Young running backs that show this level of efficiency and good offenses typically are big time hits in fantasy. So with Devon A. Chan, it's really a very similar case to Jameer Gibbs, except the fact that we're talking about him as a round three steal in home leagues right now makes absolutely no sense. This is the definition of a potential top 18 overall profile. And to be honest, if you had told me his ADP was 13th, 14th overall, I would have probably even ranked him that high. The fact that I have him at 18 right now just kind of goes to show you that that feels almost cautious to me in the sense that when you're comparing where he's going in these home leagues versus where I'd value him, like if the running back thirst was higher and he was going higher than even where I had him ranked, you can make the very well case that I have him too low. Yeah, like I'm totally cool. If you guys take Brees Hall or Bijan with your first round pick and you know you can get wide receivers in the mid rounds, take HN in the second round. Like yeah. I'm totally fine with that. I have him ranked at 16th overall right now. And you could, like I have him, Barkley and, and Taylor all kind of in a cluster together. You could reasonably yeah. make the argument for one guy over the other. The guy that I think has the highest ceiling of that group is HN because of the, the yeah. upside that he provides as a second year running back in. Again, it, it's an understatement how big of a, of advantage the Dolphins offense are schematic uh, schematically. They know exactly how to scheme their running backs, great rushing lanes, great touches that are going to result in those goal line opportunities being cashed in, in those long touchdowns being um, being cashed in 70 yards downfield because A-Chan is the perfect prototype for this offense. So speaking of the kind of Shanahan system, a guy that was a big beneficiary of that last year was Nico Collins. Man, I swear I've done the song and dance with Nico Collins all off season, but the fact that we're talking about him as a must draft player for me as a round two overall pick, and he's going in the round three portion of your home league drafts, man, if he's available anytime past the top 24, you hit the draft button on Nico Collins. It's pretty simple. Anytime I can get a 25-year-old potential superstar wide receiver attached to an elite quarterback with CJ Stroud and a top-end level offense headlined by Bobby Slowick, 
I am pushing the draft button on Nico Collins. Again, we know, you know, six foot four, 215 pounds, that prototype ball winning X wide receiver, but he also graded as an elite separator, according to Matt Harmon's reception perception, 94th percentile against man, 67th, uh, second percentile against zone, 96th percentile against press, the prototype X wide receiver numbers, you know, a little bit weaker against zone, very, very strong against man and press coverage. Not to mention, if you actually look at his man coverage composite, According to Hayden Weeks over on Underdog Fantasy, he graded second in the league only behind C.D. Lamb at beating man coverage. So the reason why I think people aren't quite as bullish on Nico Collins as me and you are when you're looking at this home league ADP is that they have more optimism on, you know, Stefan Diggs comparatively to what we do. A lot more optimism that, you know, Stefan Diggs is that stud wide receiver we saw in Buffalo over the last few years. But to put it simply with Stefan Diggs, he was not playing him like himself in the back half of last year. As you guys can see, the comparison of prime Stefan Diggs versus last year, Stefan Diggs, according to Matt Harmon's reception perception in his prime. I mean, he was literally unfucked with the bull. We're looking at 97th percentile, 96th percentile, 96th percentile against man zone and press respectively. All those numbers dropped off considerably last year, 76, 67, 75th. So with Nico Collins at this point, he is both the most talented wide receiver on this team and also has the most unique profile of these Texans wide receivers. Mm -hmm. Stefan Diggs, Tank Dow kind of playing more of that vertical Z wide receiver role. Nico Collins, I think best profiles to be that main X receiver. And when we're talking about 12 personnel, when we're talking about two wide receiver sets, I feel most confident that Nico Collins will be the last to leave the field. So to sum it up, Elite player that can overcome inferior ones. I do believe Nico Collins is the best receiver on this team. Gets a significant quarterback advantage to other wide receivers in muddy rooms and has the most unique role, like I said, of these Texans receivers. Really, when you're jotting it down, the only pessimism that people have holding him from where he should be ranked is Stefan Diggs. But I'm here to say that Stefan Diggs you're scared of is not the same Stefan Diggs going into 2024. Yeah, and um, I've been doing a little bit of research on the back end for the number one draft strategy video where basically I look at the hit rates similar to what I did with running backs of like breakout candidates and trusty veterans and running backs or wide receivers in their prime. And Nico Collins fits the best archetype, whereas Nick, uh, Tank Dell is more of the breakout candidate type. Stefan Diggs more of the trusty veteran type. And those wide receivers in their prime hit at the highest rate. If you have a wide receiver one season under your belt and you're under the age of 28 years old, you are like nearly hitting at a 60% rate, basically. Like it, Nico Collins is just such a good bet, especially, dude, like he goes 16th overall on underdog and you can get him in the mid thirties in home league, in home league ADP. You can get him at the three, four turn in some cases on like ESPN. So it's just completely mispriced. Like Diggs goes higher in home league ADP simply by name value. And it should not be the case as we kind of made reference to already. So A-Chan and Collins, two guys that we have just absolutely hammered the draft button on. Jalen Waddle, also a very easy click for both yeah. of us, goes much higher in sharper platforms, just like Nico Collins. On underdog, he is consistently off the board by the end of the second round. You can get him in the mid to late third in home league drafts. His 2023 season, was marred by injury, but that happens, man. The, the Dolphins offense is virtually bust proof. If both Waddle and Hill are on the field and Tua's playing quarterback and whoever's back there at running back, hey. this scheme is so good that it's going to make every target valuable. It's going to make the average seven yard slant pass for their offense way more valuable than the average seven yard slant pass for like the Saints, for example. This this offense and Jalen Waddle specifically has the upside to really, really smash, especially early in the season. We know the Dolphins are a, a, a warm weather team. They always get off to hot starts. And especially if Tyreek were to miss any time, Jalen Waddle does have a chance to be a 20 point per game score. But at the very least, you're getting a guy who's locked into like 15 to 17 points per game, getting him at the tail end of round three after drafting, let's say, Garrett Wilson and Jameer Gibbs to begin your draft and tacking on Jalen Waddle as the third player on your team feels so good getting that kind of upside and also that kind of safety in that range of the draft. And again, he also fits the bill as a guy who's finished as a wide receiver one before who's under the age of 28. So also a very safe projection to return on ADP and potentially crush. Yeah, and we saw two years ago when he was fully healthy, he was the wide receiver eight in fantasy, had eight receiving touchdowns, nearly 1,400 receiving yards. And I mean, that's just not a profile you typically are able to get in the third round of your drafts. Not to mention the other factor, the Dolphins were tied for the lead most in terms of rushing touchdowns last year with 27, along with the 49ers and the Lions. You can even make the case that Raheem Mostert ran hot on touchdowns last year, was able to stay healthy. If he's banged up at all, again, Unless we're projecting a huge overall takeover by HN, you know, a 20 plus touchdown level takeover, 
there could be more room in the passing game for, for us to see potentially more passing touchdowns for both Tua Tonga Bailoa and more receiving touchdowns for both Jalen Waddle and Tyree Kill. Again, this is a very consolidated target hierarchy. We know Tyree Kill is going to do his thing. We know Jalen Waddle is going to do his thing. No real ancillary threats on this team unless you're talking about the corpse of Odell Beckham Jr. or a potential breakout from Jonu Smith potentially taking work from these two options. So with Jalen Waddle, man, like you said, Third round, anytime I can get a, core, a wide receiver that is this level of talent attached to this level of offense, I think it's a smash pick. Yeah, I mean, I feel like if you watched the Dolphins last year, it was either Tyreek with the big plays or it was the running backs with the big plays. You didn't see Jalen Waddle run hot on big plays whatsoever. And I honestly just think that was because he was playing through injury. I think yeah. he will run a lot hotter on big plays going forward. And that's just kind of like a variance factor that we have to factor in for these wide receivers. So let's get into the round four range. Spoiler alert, it's all wide receivers here because especially in home leagues, man, you can get some great values on all three of these wide receivers, all three of which are two, three turn picks on underdog. Again, we're talking about players that go a lot higher in sharper formats. My guy here is Devontae Smith, who is very similar to Jalen Waddle because obviously he's a very talented number two receiver behind a superstar caliber player in A.J. Brown. I love Devontae Smith. I think he's a top 15 real life wide receiver. A.J. Brown is the only reason he doesn't go higher. He's a former wide receiver one in points per game, just like Jalen Waddle under the age of 28. So we're talking about a wide receiver in his prime who's been a proven dude before. He's attached to a top five to 10 scoring offense with the Philadelphia Eagles, which, like I said, is virtually a lock for a two, three turn pick most of the time. But he doesn't go there because of A.J. Brown's presence. And that's why I love Devontae Smith this year, because you look at his ceiling. If the Eagles throw the ball more, and I believe they will, Kellen Moore coming in, he's been part of very pass-heavy offenses with Justin Herbert and Dak Prescott in his previous stops. The Eagles have been bottom 12 in the NFL and pass rate over expected the last two years. So we're looking at an offense that has some upside to throw a little bit more. And apparently, Devontae Smith is having the best training camp of his career, according to a lot of the beat reporters. Also has some contingent value, obviously, if A.J. Brown misses any time. So just like Jalen Waddell, I think you're getting like a 15 to 17 PPR point per game projection with upside that if AJ were to miss time, he could be even better than that. I also think an underrated factor to Devontae Smith, because I, I did end up raising him a little bit. Uh, he was a guy that I had uh, as a, you know, I believe wide receiver 24 or 25 at first. He is now uh, a wide receiver 22. You can make the case of him being ahead of Metcalf and more, but that's about the range I view him in. With Devontae Smith, though, he has been getting more work in the slot in training camp, according to a lot of beat reports. And the other underrated factor, which gives a lot of credence to that, is that Apparently, Johnny Wilson has been working with the first team. And with Johnny Wilson, if you guys are unfamiliar with the prospect profile, six foot seven, 220 plus pound wide receiver that can play both as a power slot, but also be able to contribute on the outside. We saw in recent years, Quez Watkins, to put it simply, was not your prototype, you know, outside type of wide receiver. So if Johnny Wilson is getting more snaps and has that big body to play more on the outside, and we do get potentially more snaps from Devontae Smith in the slot, I mean, we've seen with Kellen Moore. Keenan Allen would be very productive in the slot in his time over at the Chargers. With C.D. Lamb, of course, with the Dallas Cowboys, very productive in the slot. So if he is getting more slot snaps, we could even see the best career season for Devontae Smith this year. Yeah, yeah. I have him a top 20 receiver. I think he is the perfect guy that if you go running back heavy early and you need a wide receiver two or a wide receiver three to help fill out your wide receiver core in a PPR league with three wide receivers and two flexes or whatever, Smith is just such an easy bet to be a hit this year. Cooper Cup is more of your upside swing. I would say Cup, I have Cup ranked higher than Devontae Smith for the upside reason, but I actually do think Devontae Smith on a median projection I prefer to Cooper Cup. But uh, let's let's sing the song and dance to the Cooper Cup upside. Yeah, I mean, I've talked about Cooper Cup at nauseum this offseason. Uh, he is currently my wide receiver 16. And I mean, it's also compounded now with the fact that apparently Pukunuku, again, it doesn't sound like it's a serious injury, but has been battling some lower body issues. I believe it was a knee injury he's been battling this offseason. Yeah, training camp, yeah so. it sounds like he's he's got like an injury. It's not expected to be uh, an injury that keeps him out of week one, but it'll probably keep him out of training camp a little bit. And a lot of the beat reporters have been saying like Cup is the dude in training camp too. Yeah, and it's easy to see why. I get it that Cup's season in 2023 was one of inconsistency and injury, but when he was playing over 50% of the snaps with Stafford in the lineup, he was still very productive in fantasy, was the wide receiver 17, nearly 16 PPR points per game. Again, not prime Cooper Cup level status, but when you contextualize these numbers, over a 26% target share in that, in that stretch is good for this type of profile. The main alert for me, though, and why I am drafting Cooper Cup ahead of this round four range again a guy that i would be willing to take at that two three turn is 
I think this could potentially be one of the top 10 offenses in the NFL. Obviously, Sean McVay calling the shots, good offensive line play, more added competition in the backfield to be able to move the chains on a consistent basis. But at the end of the day, we could talk about all of the ancillary pieces of the offense. But like you said, this offense runs through Matthew Stafford, Puka Nakua, and Cooper Cup. And when Cooper Cup has been healthy, he has still been a stud level wide receiver in the NFL. Top two target on offense that has consistently performed as one of the best and most efficient in the NFL when Stafford has been healthy. And really, I would rather just take this swing on big time upside that we do see Cup reclaim his form from a couple years ago over these, you know, safe low end wide receiver two projections in this round four range. Yeah, again, Cup, the best predictor of future fantasy success is past fantasy success. He has yeah. the best wide receiver season in the history of fantasy football. So this dude has legit game breaking upside. Even if Puka Nakua is technically the number one receiver of this team now, Cooper Cup could still easily have 17, 18 PPR points per game in a consolidated offense with a great passing quarterback who legitimately could be an MVP candidate this year. We've seen him just a couple of years ago post like a 40 touchdown season. It wouldn't be totally shocking for Matthew Stafford to do that yet again. So honorable mention, and then we'll close this video out. We do also have DK Metcalf in this range where, if again, if you need another wide receiver, if you're at the tail end of the uh, fourth round, mid fourth round area. DK Metcalf is a guy that I think one of these former wide receiver ones under the age of 28. So again, good, similar projection to Smith and Waddle and those type of guys, new offensive coordinator, Ryan Grubb wants to air the ball out. He came from the university of Washington. They had Odunze, they had Polk, they had McMillan. They pushed the ball downfield. That is precisely DK Metcalf specialty. As we know, I think JSN will take a step forward this year and really step up as like a PPR chain mover. But I actually think that will help DK Metcalf because DK Metcalf Great. will get the valuable targets even if jsn outright out targets him which i think is definitely possible we could see dk metcalf have 10 touchdowns we could see him have a couple long 40 plus yard catches this year metcalf to me is just one of these rock solid 15 point per game projections with upside that he could run hot on touchdowns he could run hot on big plays and have a 17 18 ppr point per game season i think geno smith is going to love jsn over the middle of the field and if he's able to feast over the middle of the field it's going to open up the play action game it's going to open up the downfield passing game for metcalf because i think the problem for metcalf the past couple of years has been lockett's been in steady decline and hasn't been able to to stretch the field or work over over the middle nearly as effectively and with a combination of Lockett still there JSN taking a step forward and Noah Fant also helping stretch the field and the run game being healthy with those two guys I think this offense is just going to move really really well and the architect of it all is Ryan Grubb I think he is going to be the reason why Metcalf has one of his best seasons of his career yeah and the reason why because you kind of mentioned having guys around DK Metcalf do make DK Metcalf perform better is that I'm going to be honest. He's not your do-it-all wide receiver. He's not your CD Lamb. He's not your Justin Jefferson. He's not your Jamar Chase. He's not your consistent three-level threat. But what DK Metcalf does so well is creating explosive plays. Washington last year ranked top 10 in terms of both pass rate over expectation and top 10 in overall deep ball frequency. So with Ryan Grubb coming in, I do think that is a big advantage to DK Metcalf's game stylistically. And if you actually isolate the profile in terms of games that JSM played over 60% of the snaps and Geno Smith was healthy in 2023. DK Metcalf was very productive, nearly a 24% target share in that stretch, 15.62 PPR points per game, which ranked as the wide receiver 14 and over two yards per route run at 2.131. We mentioned uh, Tyler Lockett evidently in decline, dropping from over two yards per route run. I believe it was at 2.31 in his peak year in 2021. We saw that decline down to 1.61 in 2023. So with Tyler Lockett potentially taking a step back, JSN potentially impacting that first level of the field, creating some more attention around, you know, the middle of the defense, the linebackers being able to get them in. We could see potential one-on-one -on -one shots down the field to DK Metcalf. And with DK Metcalf, I think this is a talented guy. I think again, six foot four, four three speed, that level of deep ball prowess could really complement what Ryan Grubb's trying to bring to this offense. Yeah, I mean, I think you're underselling a little bit how much they push the ball downfield. Michael Penix had 117 deep targets last year, yeah. which was how much is this? 30 more than the next closest quarterback, which was Drake May. Um, yeah. we're talking, he literally pushed the ball downfield so much that he was 30 pass attempts deep ahead of any other quarterback in the country in the funny enough, five. funny enough. Uh, one of the comps that Michael Penix, I actually had for him was Geno if Smith. he worked out Geno Smith. So, yeah, exactly. So everything's kind of lining up for DK Metcalf to potentially have a great season this year. And I think that's why he is a good mid fourth round pick. I think the reason I've been diving in on this, like cluster of wide receivers in the mid rounds is because it's 
seemingly hard to decide between them, right? Like you look at, you're like, oh, I could see the case for George Pickens. I could see the case for Zay Flowers. I could see the case for Devontae Smith. I could see the case for DJ Moore. Like you have to really think about who's going to be the guy that actually hits because there's a good chance that some of these guys are just fine. Some of these guys really crush. Some of these guys outright bust or get injured. So you do have to make decisions on the clock when you're doing this. And I think Metcalf is one of the guys that I want to be overweight on at this area of the draft, particularly in home leagues, because in, again, an underdog, you have to take them in the early third round. You do not have to take them that high in home league drafts. So this one, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Like the video. If you did, this was our must draft players rounds one to four guys that we can't stop hammering in the early uh, first couple rounds of fantasy football drafts. If you want all of our rankings, if you want access to the FSC versus Home League ADP that we showcased in this video, you can check out our draft guide. Link will be down below for that. You can get one of two ways. If you want to sign up on Underdog, use the promo code FSC with 10 bucks. You'll get our draft guide in your email inbox for tw within 24 hours for free when you sign up on Underdog using code FSE. Or if you already have an Underdog account or you can't play Underdog where you live, you can also uh, sign up on flockfantasy.com and use the promo code FSE over there. Seven days for free, 30% off. You'll actually get all the draft guides of the other creators on the site as well, in addition to our draft guides. So if you follow Mason, if you follow Zach and Badake, the Dynasty Domain guys, they also have draft guides live on the site. And you'll get access to all of that bonus content and make sure to use code FSE when you sign up over there. So with that being said, peace out and we'll talk to you soon.